other day, I filmed a video about the top 10 strongest quirks in all of My Hero Academia. And as with that kind of video, I had to do a little bit of cursory research on quirks and how they work and how they come about in the world of My Hero Academia. But then I filmed another video about how Overhaul as a character could probably be way more broken than he is because of how quirks work in the My Hero Academia universe. And while I was filming that video, I talked about how the power system in My Hero Academia is incredibly simple and easy to digest. How either you're born with a quirk or you're not born with a quirk, and it's really as easy as that. However, as I did more and more research into quirks, I began to remember that quirks are actually a lot more complicated than even I realized. See, while quirks can be described in a hand-wavy way of saying they're essentially just mutations, their history and the technical way in which they work is actually a lot more complicated than that. The history of quirks is cool. They're passed down genetically. There's different categories of quirks. Some quirks manifest more than other quirks, while other quirks only manifest once. What on the surface appears to be an incredibly simple power system, one that doesn't require much in the way of any kind of explanation, as when you have the question, oh, why does he have that ability? The answer is usually because they were born that way. But there is so much information about quirks, I figured I should make a video explaining everything there is to know about quirks because there's so much more than just oh they were born with it which is why today i'm excited to say we're covering all things quirks but before we go into a deep dive of one of the more underestimated power systems in all of new gen anime guys please for me like this video subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell and if you want to hear me talk more about mha or just all anime in general guys go ahead and follow my anime podcast who talk is anonymous where me and danny mana break down everything that happened in anime this week it's available on youtube spotify and apple podcasts so quirks formerly known as meta abilities what are they? How did they come to be? How did they get their name? What does the future of quirks look like? Well, we're gonna answer all those questions and more, but first, let's start this video off like we tend to start these kinds of videos off and answer the easy questions. And the easiest out of all of those questions is, What's a quirk? Well, a quirk in the simplest sense is a superhuman ability that any human can be born with. But the thing about quirks is that you can only be born with them. You can never develop a quirk. So whatever ability you're born with, that's the ability you're stuck with for the entirety of your life, with obvious exceptions being all for one and one for all. And kind of other quirks like overhaul and copy, but whatever, you get it. Quirks are technically unique to every person born with them. That is to say that every single person has a unique quirk. That being said, quirks can fall into categories, with one of the most prominent categories being elemental releases like fire or ice quirks. And while technically every single fire or ice user in these specific categories has a unique quirk, a lot of their quirks do work in indiscernibly similar ways. Pretty much the only variance in fire uses is how hot their fire is or the output of fire that they can use use, but still technically unique to them. Which is kind of crazy when you consider the fact that 80% of the human population all have quirks. But it wasn't always that way. Quirks had to come from somewhere. So let's somewhat briefly go over the history of quirks, or as I should say, the history of meta abilities. See, because the name quirk didn't come around until pretty deep into the history of quirks. When quirks first came about, they were known as meta abilities. And the first ever meta ability was manifested in a baby in China. Now this baby is kind of a unique circumstance. And for more reasons than just the fact that it was the first ever baby born with a quirk. See, this baby was born with the ability to radiate light from its body, but the baby was born radiating light, which is actually rare. Most people don't manifest their quirk the second that they're born. So for both the fact that this baby was the first ever being born with a quirk and the fact that it was born manifesting its quirk, the baby was doubly rare. However, after this baby was born, oddly enough, people began manifesting quirks all across the world, which led people to theorize about where these quirks were coming from in the first place. And genuinely, people still don't know where these meta abilities slash quirks came from. Because here's the thing, it's never explicitly stated that this glowing baby grows up to be an adult that has children that then manifest the second set of quirks on Earth. It's more loosely stated that once this glowing baby showed up, a bunch of people around the world also started manifesting meta abilities, which leads people to a couple of different theories revolving around where meta abilities came from. Some people believe that meta abilities came from a virus, transmitted by mice. Other people believe that meta abilities is just a natural way in which humans are evolving. And unfortunately in the MHA universe, there's no hard evidence to support either claim. Well, obviously the idea of co-evolution on different parts of the globe is not a crazy thought. In fact, it's happened thousands of times throughout history with animals that are thousands of miles away from each other being in similar circumstances, evolving the same traits in order to adapt to said circumstances. The possibility of a worldwide virus previously unknown to humanity transmitting into a bunch of people simultaneously 
to make them manifest meta abilities also isn't a crazy theory. However, when you consider how quirks have panned out now, and that quirks can very clearly be passed down through genetics, at least to me, the idea that quirks are the natural evolution of the human race within the My Hero Academia universe makes more sense. However, regardless of where quirks came from, Quirks had a pretty universal effect on how humanity was run. See, the problem with Quirks is that it gave a lot of people who shouldn't have power powers. And thus, after everybody was done being like, ooh, ah, shiny baby, they realized that the serial killer down the street now has gun arms, which led to a period of incredibly high crime as supervillains popped out of the woodwork. And even though in the early days of meta ability manifestation, the minority became much stronger than the majority. And thus, those without quirks quickly became second-class citizens. However, the ordinary citizens didn't stand for this for very long. In fact, these ordinary citizens who were being bullied by the more powerful minority took matters into their own hands. And thus, in order to to bring order to the current society, these ordinary citizens became vigilantes, which brought about the Vigilantes era. Now, the Vigilantes era is depicted in the Vigilantes manga, which is a spin-off prequel from the MHA manga, and therefore the first ever heroes in the My Hero Academia universe were Vigilantes. However, the idea of Vigilantes quickly became outdated, as avenues to become real official heroes quickly opened up to the public. But we're not quite there yet. See, during these Vigilantes era is when All For One actually began to get his hooks in society. I'm sorry, I lied earlier when I said the Vigilantes, the spinoff manga takes place during the Vigilantes era. That's not true. The Vigilantes manga takes place like four to five years prior to Deku meeting All Might. So they're like Vigilantes, non-approved heroes in the modern day world. But obviously they were inspired by the Vigilantes from the Vigilante era, which have now become outdated and unnecessary because of the systems in which you can go through to become a hero. Got it? Good. Back to All For One. In this Vigilantes era, which took place over a hundred years ago, I believe. Somewhere around a hundred years ago. All For One was gaining a ton of positive press. This is because All For One, with his meta ability, All For One, was able to sue the large amount of society through the usage of his own power. See, anybody who didn't want their quirk could go up to All For One and have their quirk taken away from them by All For One. And on the opposite end, anybody who wanted a quirk could be given a quirk by All For One. Meaning that All For One and his meta ability granted everybody around him a way to live their life the way they wanted to live it. And genuinely, if that's where things stopped, that would have been great. He kind of would have been like Planned Parenthood. If you want the kid, we can help you get it. If you don't want the kid, we can help you not get it. However, All For One didn't stop there. While he was gaining a ton of positive press as the guy who was helping society return back to normal, in actuality, anybody he gave a quirk to immediately became his follower and had to do basically whatever he wanted. As built into every quirk that All For One gives somebody, it's a clause that if you try to reject him, you die. And thus, slowly but surely, not only did All For One build an arsenal of very powerful quirks, but also an army. And things went on this way for a while, until All For One decided that his seemingly quirkless brother needed a quirk really badly. And therefore, he gave him a quirk that allowed him to stockpile power within his body. However, little did All For One know that his brother actually already had a quirk. However, his brother's quirk technically doesn't have a power outside of the fact that it can be passed down to other people. So now his brother had two quirks, the ability to stockpile power and the ability to pass that quirk down. And thus, One For All was born. A little while after this, a man by the name of Chikara Yotsubashi was born. Now, Chikata Yotsubashi is one of the most famous villains in the entirety of MHA's universe, as Chikata is the original Destro, not Redestro, the original Destro. That is to say that Chikata is the founder of the Meta Liberation Army, and also an ancestor of Riki Yotsubashi, also known as Redestro, who later revived the Meta Liberation Army that his ancestor Chikata created. Now, the Meta Liberation Army are kind of like libertarians, except instead of child wives and guns, they have quirks, and their ideology is that the free usage of quirks is a basic human right, in that you should be able to use your quirk in any capacity at any time, emphasizing liberation over regulation, as doing things like using your quirk in public spaces is actually illegal, on account of the fact that there's like a million people who can breathe fire. But Chikara is actually more than just Destro. See, Chikara, when he was growing up, was relentlessly bullied for his quirk, but his mother very publicly supported him and stated that his meta ability is just a quirk of his. And while the public didn't love this, in fact, they murdered her for it, which seems like an overcorrection if you ask me, decades after her murder, Quirk became pretty much the official name for meta abilities, and she was later posthumously referred to as the mother of Quirks. That is to say that she was the person who changed them from being meta abilities to Quirks. But just because we had a new spiffy name for Quirks doesn't mean that society had ironed out what to do with them. See, we currently had supervillains running around using their newfound powers to do all kinds of bad stuff. 
stuff. We had regular people with weapons trying to battle against these supervillains called vigilantes. And somewhere in the middle of all this were regular police officers who were stuck between whether or not they should be hiring people with quirks to battle against the other people with quirks or just stick to their quite literal guns. However, the police force came to the realization that their job was to prioritize leadership and maintaining the status quo of the country. And thus the police force as a whole decided to not use their quirks to battle against those with quirks, deducing that massive quirk-based battles between the police and supervillains would lead to more death and destruction than if the police didn't have quirks, or at the very least didn't use their quirks. But because police decided to stick to being police and not superheroes to fill the void of guns ain't gonna fix this problem, a new profession popped up across the world, and that was crime-fighting heroes that later became known as pro-heroes. And this all actually originated in the USA. Yes, the first place with pro-heroes in the entirety of the My Hero Academia universe wasn't Japan, as you would assume with most manga. No, it was America. And not just anywhere in America, for some reason, Rhode Island. Ah, yes. Crime-ridden Rhode Island. The 10-mile-wide sliver of mostly beaches and dentists. The state that even New England forgets about. However, with the existence of pro heroes on the rise, vigilantes began to disappear. As there was now really no need to be a vigilante, as crime was being mopped up by the pro heroes and the police. And vigilantes who wielded quirks in battles against supervillains could just go into the pro hero system and become pro heroes. And considering the fact that pro heroes have the authority to use their quirks in public and basically destroy anything around them if it comes down to it, it was substantially easier and less dangerous for vigilantes to become pro heroes. As vigilantes, as they're not approved by the law to operate in the means in which they're operating, would have to battle against supervillains and then flee the scene. But at the beginning of pro hero history, the idea to allow human beings to use their quirks in massive battles against supervillains was widely frowned upon, as people came to the same conclusion that a lot of police forces came to, that massive quirk-based battles would lead to tons of destruction and death. I mean, look at New York and every Marvel movie ever. Ever. However, as time went on and more and more extraordinary pro heroes popped up, crime rates plummeted and therefore approval rates skyrocketed. But as quirks became more abundant in human society, their usage also skyrocketed. Where people might have used to drive to work, if they have flame abilities, they could now fly to work. And thus, they would light their hands and their feet on fire and get to flying. And in tons of other circumstances, quirks were being used publicly to make life more convenient. However, when a bunch of untrained people begin to use incredibly powerful and dangerous quirks on a daily basis, basis around a bunch of other untrained people, problems began to arise. People died, and thus world governments began to crack down on the usage of quirks, which is where things like the Meta Liberation Army came into play. And they rallied against these restrictions, saying that it's their basic human right to use these quirks whenever and on whatever that they want. And they struggled against the world governments for a couple of decades until they were wiped out. These regulations came at a good time, because now roughly 80% of the human population has quirks. And in a world where 80% of people have magical superpowers, you need a couple of rules. And this 80% is only getting higher, as it stated that Deku might actually be the hero's last chance to battle against All for One, as One for All can't be used at its highest level of potential unless the inheritor is quirkless. And in the next couple of generations, there may no longer be anyone who's quirkless to pass down One for All to. So now that we know the history of quirks and where they came from, let's switch to elaborating on what quirks are. See, because like I said, we we can explain it in a hand wavy way of saying that they're superhuman abilities that some humans are born with, but there's actually a lot more intricacy to them than just that. See, earlier when I stated that I believe that quirks are the next step in human evolution, as opposed to being a virus passed through humanity by mice, I think the best point to corroborate that possibility is the fact that in order to check for whether or not people have quirks, doctors will check to see in children if they have an additional joint in their pinky toe. See, the majority of human beings have two joints in their pinky toes, as every other toe in your foot has two joints. However, as your pinky toe is substantially smaller than all of your other toes, the second joint on your pinky toe is kind of useless. If you grab your pinky toe and you try to bend this final joint, you might be able to wiggle it a little bit, but the majority of the movement that one can achieve from their pinky toe comes from this second joint. And even at the same time, if you have a massive amount of dexterity in this final joint of your pinky toe, it really doesn't add that much to your movement ability. I'm sorry, I lied, your big toe only has one joint. I knew I would get at least one comment about it. And therefore, doctors are able to deduce if a child is gonna manifest a quirk if they only have one joint in their pinky toe. Because having just one joint in their pinky toe shows that they've streamlined their evolution. That is to say, in less roundabout terms, that those with one joint in their pinky toe are more evolved. And since their pinky toes show a higher level of evolution than a standard human, they should also manifest a quirk. And since we're tying a streamlining of evolution into whether or not somebody will manifest a quirk, it feels pretty blatant that we're saying that quirks are 
evolution and not just the virus. Now, the reason that doctors have a test to see if somebody will manifest a quirk is because a lot of people aren't born with their quirk manifesting immediately. While people like the glowing baby and present Mike were born with their abilities manifesting immediately, most children are stated to manifest their quirks before they turn four years old. But some people do manifest their quirks after they turn four. This is why people like Deku were able to lie about manifesting one for all at 14-ish. While late bloomers of this level are incredibly rare, it does happen sometimes, when in actuality, most late bloomers just manifest their quirks at like five or six, which is kind of unfortunate because quirks don't manifest gradually over time. It's just one day you don't have quirks and the next day you do, which I could imagine is especially horrific for heteromorphs. Because here's the thing, we don't know whether or not heteromorphs are born like that or they just wake up one day and look like that. Now, heteromorphs, to those of you who don't know, are people whose quirks make their appearance look different. So think Tokuyami or Annie Voice. While it stands the reason that most heteromorphs are born heteromorphs, we have no confirmation of whether or not they are. So there's a possibility that some heteromorphs are born looking like standard children and then they turn four and they just turn into Windex Man. But the whole being born as a heteromorph thing is probably the more likely conclusion. Though heteromorph or not, it is unfortunate that quirks manifest immediately. For people like Shigaraki, whose quirk is that anything they touch with all five fingers turns into ash. Because one day you're a regular child and the next day your entire family and your home is gone. In a less severe circumstance of this, Kirishima manifested his quirk in the middle of the night when he needed to go to the bathroom. And when he went to rub one of his eyes, he just sliced his face. Kind of crazy about quirks is that some quirks are just common, which is weird when you consider the fact that quirks might be genetic. Like if we're assuming that quirks are just the standard next step in human evolution, it would stand to reason that different types of quirk would manifest at similar rates. Is there's genuinely no reason for somebody to manifest the fire quirk over something like dark shadow. And yet, while there's hundreds, if not thousands, if not possibly millions of people who can use fire-based quirks, there's only a couple of people who have the ability to do things like spatial warping or regeneration or dark shadow. It's even weirder than this is that some people's quirks give them one ability and one ability alone. Seiryu's quirk ability allows him to shoot tape out of his elbows. Bakugo's ability allows him to make nitroglycerin from his palms. But other people's quirk abilities grant them the ability to do multiple things. And I'm not even talking about Shoto, whose quirk is half cold, half hot. Because one could argue that his quirk just gives him the ability to use ice and fire. I'm talking about people whose quirks give them the ability to do multiple, very separate things. A good example of this are people whose quirks are just animals, like Suyu or Gang Orca. Gang Orca's quirk, Orcanus, grants him superhuman physiology, speed, and strength because he has the body of an orca who gang up on great white sharks. But on top of this, he can also make hypersonic waves with his brain that allow him to read his surroundings. He can swim at incredibly high speeds. He can breathe underwater. He can do basically anything an orca can do. And in the case of Suyu, it's no different. She can bound incredibly long distances. She can stick to walls. She has a long, sticky tongue. Multiple quirk factors that all tie into frog or orca, but all do very different things. But it's not even just limited to people whose quirk is animal, as Kaina Tsutsumi's quirk gives her two separate abilities that have nothing to do with animals, as Kaina is not only able to make a rifle with her elbow, but also turn her hair into any different kind of bullet, two incredibly separate abilities that have nothing to do with each other, outside of the fact that she's creating a rifle and creating something to shoot out of said rifle. But if you were to extrapolate a quirk like that and put it on somebody like Bakugo, that would be like if Bakugo could not only create nitroglycerin from his hands, but also create the gauntlets that he wears to fire off said nitroglycerin. You see what I'm saying? There's variability into the amount of quirk factors that your quirk has. But quirks can also be sentient, as people like Tokuyami's quirk manifest the thing known as Dark Shadow, which is a completely sentient being that lives within him. And it's not like it's a manifestation of his will or anything like that. No, it's a completely sentient, separate being that lives inside of him that sometimes disobeys him. And he's not the only circumstance of this. Roddy Soul from the third MHA movie has a quirk that gives him a little bird that follows him around that acts on whatever his true will wants. Now, while talking about this tiny bird named Pino in the same capacity as Tokuyami's Dark Shadow is probably kind of a stretch. They are still two sentient quirks, which is super weird when you think about it. Because in actuality, Dark Shadow could kill Tokuyami. However, your quirk having the capacity to kill you isn't something that's particularly rare. In fact, most quirks have drawbacks. The most obvious drawbacks are things like Aizawa's Dry Eye from using his Erasure quirk. Deku's body not being able to manifest the entirety of One for All and therefore shattering every time he throws a 100% punch. Endeavor's overheating by using too 
much of his fire, Shoto's frostbite from using too much of his ice. Pretty much every single quirk has drawbacks. However, interestingly enough, alongside with your quirk usually manifests a resistance to said quirk. But this isn't always the case, and a good example of that is Dobby. See, Dobby's fire burns the hottest out of anybody in the entirety of MHA, even hotter than Endeavor, the now number one hero on Earth. However, because his fire burns so hot, and because his body isn't built to have a fire quirk, but instead an ice quirk, every time that Dobby uses his flames, he burns his skin. But there are less severe cases than Dobby. Ayama, also known as Naval Laser, was born with a naval laser. However, without the usage of the belt given to him by All for One, Ayama's naval laser would just leak out of his stomach. And in that capacity, he's very similar to Cyclops, where he needs a piece of equipment to relocate the lasers coming out of his body. However, he kind of has the opposite problem from Cyclops, in that the lasers don't work until the belt goes on. However, maybe the wildest things about Quark's period is the fact that whatever Quark you get can actually influence who you are as a person. And I'm not just talking about Tokuyami being afraid of the dark because Dark Shadow might break out in the dark. No, I'm saying there are real-life psychological implications to having certain Quarks. A good example of this is Twice whose quirk gave him crippling bipolar disorder and multi-personality disorder. And one of Twice's closest friends on the entire Earth, Toga, is also affected by this. As pretty much the entirety of the conversation around Toga is everybody telling Toga to be normal. However, Toga never had the option to be normal, and this is why she's actually a really cool character. Toga is, quite literally, mentally ill. See, Toga's quirk that requires her to drink somebody's blood to transform into them hard rewired her brain into enjoying blood and gore and conflating blood and gore with loving somebody. And and thus, when Toka began to admire somebody, she not only wanted to become them, but also to drink their blood to become them. And thus, the wires between love, transformation, and blood and gore all got crossed, which led Toga to be unable to live what many would deem as a regular life. However, it's largely believed that these wires getting crossed was a bifactor of Toga needing to be able to use her quirk, at least genetically, or psychologically, or biologically. See, in order for Toga to be able to drink the blood of somebody else and turn into them, Toga A had to not be grossed out by blood and B had to have no conscience when it came to drinking somebody else's blood and becoming them. And thus it's a possibility for Toga's mind to make sure that it could use its quirk at the highest level possible, that psychologically it rewired itself to make sure that Toga would blend with the quirk as well as possible. Which I also feels like corroborates the point that quirks are biological and come from evolution. But humans aren't the only people that can manifest quirks, which kind of throws a wrench in not only the virus theory, but also the evolution theory. Because by and large, viruses usually only affect a couple of different types of animal, and while humans have definitely co-evolved with other animals, there's such a large disparity in the kinds of animals we've seen use quirks and humans in the MHA universe. See, the principle of UA High, also known as Nezu, is an animal. What kind of animal, we're not entirely sure. People think that he's a combination of a dog, a cat, and a bear. But Nezu isn't a human, and never was a human. It's not a gang orca or a suyu situation. He's not a heteromorph. He's an animal that manifested a quirk that makes him smarter than your average human, which is why he's able to use his incredible intellect to lead UA high. But Nezu isn't the only animal that manifested a quirk. There's also the monster cat and the queen bee, which means throughout the history of MHA, there's been three separate animals that have manifested quirks. And one of them is a dog, cat, bear, the other is a cat, and the other is a bee. It's just a really large disparity between different types of animals manifesting quirks. But then again, COVID started in bats, and then went to pangolins, and then went to humans, so... Who knows? But speaking of things that aren't fun, let's move on to all the ways that quirks can really mess you up. See, most people, and that is 99.999% of people, have one quirk. And one quirk works inside of a body. And this is most likely because humans have evolved to manifest one quirk in one quirk alone. However, you can technically have more than one quirk. Though in order for this to happen, you either have to have one for all and be Deku, be close enough to all for one that he bestows multiple quirks upon you, or have overhaul, which is kind of a different circumstance. But you don't want two quirks. See, having two quirks actually puts an insane amount of strain on your body. And the more quirks you add into your body, the more strain you put onto it and the less cognitive thought you're able to pull off. That is to say that every single quirk that you add to your body the dumber you get. And not only will you get dumber, but your body will also begin to deteriorate. This is exemplified in One For All users who had a quirk prior to getting One For All. While none of them have their intelligence take a dip, all of their bodies begin to deteriorate. As the pressure of holding two quirks, one of which is One For All in one vessel, is too much for anybody's body to go through. And thus wielders of One For All who had quirks prior to getting One For All really have a lifespan, with the fourth inheritor of One For All, Hikage, being the person who lived with two quirks the longest, but he was only able to maintain having those two separate quirks for 18 
18 years until he died of old age at 40. Currently stands the only people who are able to maintain having multiple quirks in their body and function at a somewhat high level are Gigantamachia, All for One, and Deku. However, other people have been able to undergo massive physical modifications to make sure that their bodies are able to maintain multiple quirks. People like Number 6 from Vigilantes, 9 from Heroes Rising, and Shigaraki have all undergone massive body modifications to make sure that they can maintain the multiple quirks given to them by All for One. On top of this, some of them either received or tried to receive quirks that would be able to negate the ill effect of having multiple quirks. Like Nine attempting to claim cell amplification to cure the cells that were degenerating in his body from having multiple quirks. But people like Gigantamaki are able to hold on to multiple quirks simultaneously because of Gigantamaki's base quirk, Endurance, which made his body incredibly durable and basically impossible to break down. And the reason that Tomura is able to hold on to multiple quirks right now is because of his regeneration quirk. But All for One now isn't the only person who's able to pass out quirks, as Dr. Garaki now also has the ability to duplicate and pass out quirks to other people, also gaining the ability to extract quirks from people's bodies. Dr. Garaki was able to pull this off by studying All for One's quirk, and through the power of science, pretty much replicate it. The usual way that most people, at least nowadays, get their quirks is from their parents. So the real reason that people believe that quirks are genetic and therefore subject to evolution is because they can be passed down from parent to child through Mendelian genetics. Mendel is kind of the grandfather of genetics and ironically was a friar and an abbot whose research ironically paved the road for confirmations of theories like evolution. But in essence, Gregor Mendel took a bunch of peas and bred them together. But he bred a bunch of different kinds of peas. And what he realized is that different kinds of peas, when bred together, will either manifest as the mother pea or the father pea, or as a combination of the two different kinds of pea. And that even if, hypothetically, let's say you take two pairs of peas and they have a child that manifests as the mother pea, that child, even though it manifested as the mother pea, could manifest father pea traits in its children. And this is how quirks work in the My Hero Academia universe. But because quirks are inherited genetically, families tend to have very very similar quirks. A great example of this is the Todoroki family. They all either have fire or ice quirks. But the reason that Endeavor wanted more and more children is because he wanted a combination of the two quirks. Another good example of this is the Ida brothers. Tensei has engines in his arms, but Ida has engines in his legs. But it doesn't always work out this way. Sometimes tall children can be born from short parents. What I'm hoping on. And therefore completely unique and unheard of quirks can manifest in children from parents with quirks that aren't even remotely related to the quirks that their children inherited. Tomura Shigaraki's grandmother's quirk was float, but he got decay. And these quirks manifest as mutations, matching how children don't always have to match the parents they come from. Even odder than this, it's a possibility that two people with quirks can have a quirkless child, like Midoriya. But regardless of what quirk you're born with, that's the quirk you're stuck with. But it doesn't mean that your quirk has to stay at the same level of strength for the entire time that you have it. See, because while most people manifest their quirk before they're four years old, that doesn't doesn't mean their quirk is done changing, as people very late on in their life can go through emotional catalysts that allow them to awaken their quirk. And many people in My Hero Academia's universe have gone through these awakenings. Toga's awakening allowed her to realize that if she transformed into somebody she loved enough, she would be able to use their quirk. Bakugo realized after being stabbed by All for One's rivet stabs that he would be able to condense and use his explosions more accurately. Geten gained the ability to control the temperature of his ice when Redestro burned himself. Uchaku gained the ability to spread her zero gravity quirk amongst people that she's not even touching after a battle against Toga. The quirk that you're born with and the abilities that come along with it aren't the only abilities you'll have for your entire life. You just gotta go through some trauma. However, much in the way that quirks can be awoken, quirks can also be suppressed. See, Tomura Shigaraki's quirk, Decay, was actually suppressed because of the trauma he went through as a child. See, in the moment of Tomura's quirk activation, he had the ability to spread his decay across the ground and swallow up entire houses. And he also had the ability to make sure that his decay was able to spread from things that he was decaying to people that were standing on the things he was decaying. However, because of how traumatic that experience was for him, he suppressed that ability. Meaning that the large majority of the time that we spend with Shigaraki, his decay ability isn't nearly as strong as it should be. However, after battling against Gigantamachia and Redestro, he reawakens his decay ability, which is why he's now able to wipe out entire cities by placing his hands on the ground. And if that sounds scary, wait until I tell you about the concept of Quirk Singularity. See, Quirk Singularity is a popular theory within the My Hero Academia universe that states as generation after generation gets more and more quirks, and those people with quirks come together and strengthen their quirks and breed with each other, that every new generation of quirk users will only get access 
to more and more powerful quirks. And Shoto is actually a really good example of this happening in real time. As Shoto, through the power of half cold, half hot, is able to manifest his mother and his father's abilities, and therefore overcome both of them in terms of strength. Dabi, also known as Toya, is also a really good example of this. As Dabi is the son of Endeavor, and while his constitution is weaker than that of Endeavor's, his flames burn hotter. And it's believed that eventually quirks will become so strong that there will be no way to control them, as every individual will wield power capable of mass destruction, which is why things like quirk restriction laws were put in place early on. And there's actually a lot of quirk restriction laws. Public display of quirks is actually against the law, and you're not allowed to use your quirks to harm other people except in cases of self-defense. You have to have your quirk registered with the government. During elementary school, children receive quirk counseling to get them used to the concept of their quirks and how to appropriately use them in society and grow with them. However, quirk counseling is also meant to catch people whose quirks might make them more deviant, like Toga. To become a hero, you have to go to a special education program. You have to get a provisional hero license and then get approved by the Department of Heroes before you can become a hero, and so on and so forth. There are a ton of rules when it comes to quirks, which there probably should be because people are able to make mountains out of ice and burn down entire cities. But those are just admitters. Yes, that's right, there are different types of quirks. We've actually already touched on this point kind of briefly earlier, but let's quickly go over for our last point in the video, the four types of quirks. First up, let's talk about emitters. Emitters are probably the most frequent type of quirk we see throughout the entirety of MHA. Emitters have the ability to either generate something and manipulate it, or manipulate existing things around them. Think Bakugo, Shoto, Kaminari. These are three examples of people who are able to generate things and then control them. However, another good example of an emitter is the guy who was able to control the paint lines on the road whose name I am forgetting because his power was the ability to control the paint lines on the roads. He isn't able to generate the paint lines on the roads, but he's able to control the paint lines on the roads, and thus he is still an admitter. But a mission in MHA actually goes further into the conceptual realm, as things like the brainwashing quirk, which is used by Hitoshi Shinso, is also considered an admission type quirk, as he's admitting a question that you answer that allows him to control your brain. Second type of quirk is transformation. These are quirks that allow people to undergo transformations to their bodies, but that be doing things like enhancing existing features, adding new features, deleting features. A good example of this is Kirishima in his hardening quirk. He's able to transform his body into an incredibly hard and sharp substance. Setsuna Tokage is able to break her body into hundreds of little bits. Shinji, also known as Dupla Arms, is able to grow a bunch of arms that have eyeballs or hands or ears at the end of them. All of these are examples of transformation quirks. The third type of quirk is heteromorphic. Now, Shinji is also technically a heteromorph. Oh, I'm an idiot his name is Shoji. I've been talking a lot about Neon Genesis recently. Well, I guess Shoji technically falls closer to the heteromorphic side of things here, as heteromorphs are described as people whose quirks give them a permanent abnormality related to their quirk, and Shoji constantly has many arms. Good examples of these heteromorphic abilities are Shoji's Dupla Arms, Ojiro's Tail Quirk, Spinner's Lizard Quirk, and Annie Voice's Rocky Head. I don't know what it has to do with his quirk, but he's considered a heteromorph. Now, being a heteromorph is kind of nice and also kind of not, because heteromorphs are immune to quirk disabling abilities like Aizawa's erasure because it's just who they are it's literally in their physical biology so that's nice but there's also the racism because heteromorphs are viewed as second-class citizens they're called mutants and there's clans like the creature rejection clan that tries to kill all heteromorphs which is why people like spinner join up with the league of villains because they want to destroy the society that suppress heteromorphs for their entire lives and thus heteromorphs like shoji have to lead from the front and be like hey listen they're not all bad. Non-heteromorphs, I mean. Non-heteromorphs are not all bad. You get it. We're moving on. The last type of quirk is the accumulation quirk. Now, this is by far and away the rarest of all quirk types. These are quirks that require some preparation. That is to say that these are quirks that don't operate correctly unless something has been done beforehand. A good example of these quirks are things like Ares Rewind. Well, Ares Rewind might seem as though it's always incredibly powerful. As long as she gets her hands on you, she's able to rewind you. The level at which Ares can use her rewind quirk is actually tied to the length of the horn on her forehead, and the more that she uses her rewind quirk, the shorter that horn gets. Therefore, if Aerie wants to use rewind at the highest level possible, she needs a long horn. Another good example of this is Fat Gum's fat absorption, as Fat Gum is able to take basically any amount of physical damage so long as he has a layer of fat on him. Another really good example of this is Fa Jin, which requires the Deku and the second inheritor of One For All do a motion repeatedly in order to build up kinetic energy in that part of their body so that they can use it explosively later on. And that's it. Every 
everything that you need to know about quirks, which is probably a lot more than you thought you need to know about quirks in the first place. And genuinely, while doing this research, I found some things out about quirks that even I didn't know. Because for a long time, I believed that quirks were an overly simplified power system, created to be overly simplistic for a somewhat younger audience to help them understand it. But the longer that you dive into the history and the mechanics of quirks, you begin to realize that there is a fair amount of nuance. So did you guys learn anything today? Tell me in the comments if you did. And while you're down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Well, even if you didn't learn anything, I did.